My name is James Hewitt. I'm a former British Army officer and I support Ukraine. You not only support Ukraine, you drive there. Well, I've been over to Ukraine, wonderful Ukraine, um, about, well, I try to go over on a, on a monthly basis um, and I've driven twice. Um, the other times I fly into Zezov, um, which is about as far as east you can, you can get to in Poland. Um, which serves as a military, um, important military airport now too. Now you've got a, um, explain your, your jacket to me. What, what's the well, stuff on this? Well, um, this is something I, so we, 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 we all wear this when we're operating there in a kind of u uniform. You like a uniform? Well, it's, I think it's important for morale and discipline, actually. <laughs> I know it sounds strange, but um, I'm part of an, a, a group called Operation Safe Drop, which is supported by Mad Foundation, Make a Difference, which is run by um, my very good friend, John Lawler. And we, we mark ourselves with this to, to signify that we're here or in Ukraine on humanitarian purposes. Uh, and we, we mark ourselves with this, the, the, the Union Jack, and obviously we sport the Ukrainian flag too. This is one that has got, normally it's blue and yellow, as you well know, but um, they turn black and red when they've got blood on them. And now it's hot where we are, so I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to take off my lucky orange hat, uh, but I'm wearing it in spirit, and you should take that off because I will too. actually because cool. it's a bit hot. We'll put some stripping music over this. <laughs> anyway. So this is, in many senses, a hostile interrogation. Um, but let's let's just while well, I've been trained, <laughs> oh, it's become so, even more hostile. <laughs> By the way, I should, so this is, uh, I actually know the guy who makes this stuff. It's, um, it's called Ace by Stokowski. If you show it to the camera, and Stokowski is some kind of tennis player of some, of some fame. Some repute. Um, and um, he's a good fellow. Um, and this wine is rather good. Oh, right, he's got a picture of, is that him? Yes, playing right. tennis. Yeah. I always used to forget uh, what his name was, but I would just go into the bar that says zigzag and just pretend to be a tennis player. <laughs> All right, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> ah, look at that, excellent. Well, this will do us a power of good. I do like the Ukrainian wines. Yes. There's some very good ones, actually. Yes. I don't know if I've tried this one. I don't think I have. I'll and pour mine first because yes. I just to take the cork off, just in case. It's a nice little touch, isn't it? How's that? Lovely. Slava Ukraine. Haram Slava. Haram Slava. Very good. Dobra. Dobra. <laughs> we'll drink to the brave chaps on the front. Yes. Let's to the chaps that. on the front. To the chaps on the front. Somebody critical of, of us would say, what on earth are you doing? And you're about three months older than me, so I'm going to call you old man. <laughs> Thanks, old boy. What on earth are you doing supporting You started this? like that the first time we met. Um, well, it, it's, it, it's a, it is a good question, actually. Um, but basically, it's... If you can't realise that it's a real battle between good and evil, and it's probably the most obvious example in my lifetime um, of that, i.e. good against evil, um, then 
you, you, you know, you need looking at, really. I think that, you know, I've always, well, since the early 80s, so that's a good well, 40, 40, or 40, 40 years ago at least, um, been against facing off, if you like, so to speak, the Soviet Union when I was stationed in Germany. You mean you, you were facing up to the Soviet Union? Yes, that's correct. Um, well, it was our job to be a part of the British Army on the Rhine, um, in, based in you know, West Germany. And at any moment, really, um, the Soviet Union could have come across the inner German border from East Germany. Um, so how old were you when you first started thinking about the Soviet Union as an enemy? Probably in my 20s. And you're, um, you're an officer in the, what, in the uh, fish and chip regiment, the, the Cheshires or something like this? You can't say that, actually. <laughs> well, I can. I can because I'm Cheshire? from. Uh, was, uh, okay, I was right, raised right, in right. Cheshire, and I very much love the Cheshire well, Regiment. And they were bloody good against the uh, yeah. uh, the Serbs when they uh, started to steal things. And uh, what happened was the Serbs would steal a bit of the convoy, and then the next morning the Serbs would find they had no tyres for their for their lorries. <laughs> so I'm a great fan of uh, of all of those regiments and in particular the Cheshire Regiment so I defend my joke you weren't in the Cheshire Regiment I wasn't in the Cheshire Regiment <laughs> I was in the Household Cavalry the the lifeguards um, Tin Bellies the Piccadilly Cowboys or whatever <laughs> but um, <laughs> here's the Piccadilly Cowboys <laughs> here's the Piccadilly Cowboys um, but people don't use that anymore. They, they won't understand what I'm talking about. These are the, uh, so for American uh, people or Europeans, whatever, these are the soldiers who guard the Queen, now the King. Well, we dress up in, in, in sort of late 18th century um, uniform. Um, and, in, you know, the, the big boots and the the cuirasses, the tunics and the helmets, which are probably the most recognisable, with the, the white plume. And, um, and the blues and rolls have the red plume. But that's a, a, a whole complicated um, story on its own. Um, and, um, and that's our ceremonial side. I mean, it's amazing, actually, I think most of the soldiers serving at Knightsbridge, from where we perform those duties, um, are probably all served in what we call the service regiments, um, reconnaissance or tanks. And um, in, in, in days when I served, we were part of the Five Airborne Brigade, so many of us had to jump out of airplanes too. So we were master of all trades. So you're, you're sat in the, the North German plane facing the armies of the Soviet Union. Did you think you were wasting your time or did you think there was a purpose to what you were doing? No, I, I didn't think we felt that we were wasting our time. There was a real purpose. Um, there was a purpose to persuade the, the, the Soviet forces that it would not be a sensible thing to to move against NATO forces. And so we, we, we practised an, an awful lot um, on Chieftain then, um, on the ranges and on exercise, and um, very often, probably once a week, once a month, um, we would hear the siren and move out of barracks into a, a wooded area that um, would change from time to time so it didn't become a you know a habitual thing um, and that was to show that we were ready to to do so at the drop of a hat and strangely enough the last that I hadn't heard the siren like that until um, more recently last year um, when I was first in um, Ukraine, 
um, the same siren, wailing siren, to warn people that there was a drone or missile in the air. And um, it rather brought back memories of old memories of 40 years. Was there some moment when you read a book or saw something made you feel, I know what I'm doing and I believe what I'm doing is right? That's very good, actually, very good um, question. But um, not really, other than the fact that one would attend um, lectures at Sandhurst and um, that was most of my learning about the Soviets in the early days. So um, it was really basically doing the job that we were trained to do um, at a much, much lower level, i.e. make sure that we could operate the, the vehicles and, you know, perform well as soldiers. Um, and I think we did that. That wouldn't have been really seen by, by the Soviets. I expect they understood to a degree um, the professionalism of, of, the, of NATO forces and the British in particular, I can talk about. Um, and clearly they actually didn't really pay much attention or certainly as has been seen with, with their rather hopeless uh, reinvasion of, of Ukraine, they were found to be wanting in many respects, not least the state of the vehicles and of the uh, inadequacy of the of the soldiers, the NCOs and the officers. Um, I think then we we understood that they that they were relying on numbers mostly, and the amount of equipment they had. When. Um, Putin is running up to the big war, February the 24th, last year, the invasion. Where are you and what are you thinking? I was sort of keeping a good eye on the news and um, as soon as it was reported that the, the medical facilities and the store of blood was brought forward, I thought, that's it. Which was probably about a month or two months before. I had the same reaction and I, um, when I flew to Kyiv on Valentine's Day, uh, February, um, February the 14th last year. I've had some bad Valentine's days in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That does sound a pretty... <laughs> Mind you, Valentine's Day in Kyiv. <laughs> when did you first go to Ukraine? Well, sadly, it wasn't until the late summer of 22. Um, I'd been trying to find a way to get out and be helpful rather than sit watching television and moaning about it. I was determined to try and do something be helpful in some way. I mean, it would have been interesting for me to be able to go out and try and help fight. But um, I think I would have got in the way a bit uh, at my age. And, um, and so I decided to try and do something on the humanitarian level. You're a knight in slightly dented armour. I'm a knight in dented armour. Yes. But you wanted to go and fight for the right thing to do. I felt very strongly about that, actually. Um, yeah, very strongly about it. What did you do? Well, I... Um, was lucky enough to, to be put in touch with John Lawler, who 
runs Mad Foundation make a difference? And he cut his teeth in... <laughs> yeah, but it's also mad. It is mad. <laughs> That's rather lovely. But, um, but you've got to be slightly like that. I mean, he cut his teeth helping humanitarianly in, in Africa. So he, he, he knew what he was doing. Um, and knows what he's doing. And he's a great chap. He's become a very good friend. And we've done a lot of missions together. We've driven a lot of miles through Europe twice. And many, 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 many thousands of kilometers in, um, in Ukraine from where we're based really in Kyiv. Um, sorry, in uh, Lviv, um, and we moved forward. In the early days, we were taking stuff forward and bringing people back, bringing um, refugees back to safety, um, either dropping them a long route in um, Kyiv or other major cities. Where did you go out to? Where were you hitting the well, south or we, the east? All over. We'd be, I'd been up to um, uh, Chechen, um, um, towards Bakhmut in Kharkiv area um, and then down as far as Odessa and uh, Dnipro Zaporizhia region By the way, mention of um, Bakhmut for anyone who doesn't understand this that's a heavy um, well the Russians have now got it but um, it, last year Bakhmut was a heavy it would go anywhere near that direction and that's a heavy thing why on earth were you risking your life to do that? Well to take provisions forward to take medical equipment to take rations to take clothing to take hospital beds forward um, and bring people back bring those who wanted to back to safety, bring refugees, old women and children back. Did, they say, did one of these people say something to you? Oh, yes. Um, we, 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 we have vans, minivans, really, crafters. They're a good, good vehicle. Um, and they can take about 12, 15 people in the back. Um, and quite a lot of provisions forward. So they would initially be completely in a state of shock, quiet, silent, frightened, many of them in many cases, and, and in a completely new environment for them. So it took several hours days of traveling um, and, and, and in that time they would open up a bit and become more trusting towards us and we gave them time to do that too um, we were there to help and to let them realize that really it was important not to be too imposing just to be helpful. Um, and there was one particular woman, I can't remember her name now, she taught English um, and, and it was in the earliest, earlier period of going to Zaporizhia area and uh, um, she started to talk a bit. She said that her apartment had been completely destroyed and she had nothing left. All she had was the bags that she carried, or the bag probably that she carried, I think. And uh, she, when we began to converse and communicate, she said that, it was lovely to be able to speak and not be afraid to voice her opinions. Um, and that was very telling. And um, when we eventually 
said farewell in in Lviv, it's very emotional. Um, you get very attached and you understand what these wonderful people have gone through completely unnecessarily. Um, it's quite amazing that they were how they were, i.e. they were still rather wonderful and friendly and understanding. And funny. They are great people, the Ukrainians. Their, their fortitude is something which is to be admired and their courage. And um, that stayed with me. It's staying with me. You've met my friend Vlad Demchenko. I have indeed. The guy who arrested me on day two for being a Russian spy. <laughs> well, anyone would. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of him? <laughs> I thought he would. He is. I thought that he, 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 he did the right thing when he arrested you. It was in Kiev he arrested you. Yes. Yes, 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 I remember. Well, <laughs> you were acting very suspiciously. <laughs> You would have arrested me. Uh, anyone in their right mind would arrest you. <laughs> anyway, um, no, I thought he was good. In fact, there was a, a colleague of his at that rather lovely supper we had um, in Mushli, um, in Lviv. A, a, a lovely restaurant in Kiev. Lovely, in Lviv. In Lviv. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, well, I thought that they mm. were both very interesting, intelligent, measured, and obviously brave chaps. Um, and although they had a different attitude to, to, to what could be done, what should be done more, um, there was a commonality of purpose, which I see time and time again. Um, and that is to their aim is victory, victory at any cost, um, victory no matter what, because otherwise, in the words of the famous wartime leader, without victory is there no, no survival. And that really rings true, it resonates. And most people in Ukraine believe and think that too. Um, it's very powerful. And there is no survival for them. It's existential, um, completely unnecessary. Um, this war that has been waged by one man, really, Putin. The perfidious little shit that he is. He's only a little man. You might have to scrub the word shit. No, I agree with you. He's a pitiless yes. psychopath. He is psychopathic. He is. I don't think he... I mean, he knows what he's doing, but he has no... In the, in the true definition of a psychopath, he's without feeling towards those that he is imposing the suffering upon, including his own people. Um, that must be the archetypal definition of what a you know a psychopath is, it couldn't he, it it couldn't be more obvious. I mean I'm no professional doctor, but I mean if people don't realise that he is a psychopath, um, more so than Hitler. And his circle of evil. I think probably he's on the same level as Stalin. 
Yes. Do you think we're doing enough in the West to help our Ukrainian friends? We, the English... We, uh, the... The the West in general. Um, I I don't think... I don't think it it is enough. Um, And we can't do as much as the Americans are able to do. And rightly have done so, but they need to do more too. They need to provide, at least provide the ATACMS um, artillery system, which can be fired by the M192 and the M270, both of which the Ukrainians have, the, the tracked, the, the HIMARS, the high mobility missile artillery system. Um, that they have can fire the ATACMs. As far as I know, I'm, I'm no gunner. Yeah, no, that's but, true. I, mean, I think. And, yeah. um, so it would it would make an, an an awful lot of difference. I think too that they they need to make sure that they definitely will get the F-16s. Um, but they need more air defence systems and ability to 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 knock out the uh, the missiles and the drones um they're doing very well on that to be fair but yes definitely the atacams will make a huge difference so you know without sort of complicating it too much definitely that perhaps some better use of of robotic systems for mine clearance. The giant Viper, which has become the Python, I think, which has got a longer reach. It's basically a a hose that's fired, lands on a minefield and then is exploded, creating a lane through which people can pass. And I think that the the Python has a 250-yard um, reach. They need a lot of that. They need that and smoke and those and um, the air tackums, as I said, mm-hmm. I think would make a huge difference. If they can just get close enough in the south to disrupt the logistics of the Russians and attack Crimea more effectively and and, and put out of operation, the, the the so-called fleet. There may be other soldiers you've met, but when certainly you've met Vlad and his pal, they were saying it was hard what they were doing. Did you understand that from your own experience? Oh, very much so. Um, it is... Well, it, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do against a, a well-defended position. Remember, the Russians have had a long time to prepare the Thorovikin lines, the defensive lines, the, the mines, the tank traps, the tank ditches, the, 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 the infantry trenches, and the artillery systems behind, you know, behind that can be used and adjusted onto the minefields depending on where they are being breached. Um, It's an incredibly difficult um, thing to do and and NATO forces wouldn't even contemplate this without having air supremacy, if not superiority. You did some of this in Iraq back in 91. Yes. But we had, um, um, we were led by a very good chap called Norman Schwarzkopf, and 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 actually some other brilliant military minds too, but he he was the the leader and the figurehead, and he insisted that he had well overwhelming number of people. Um, you have to have really um, by rule of thumb about three to one advantage if you're attacking i.e. three three times the amount of people to their one 
um, defending because it's easier to defend from a defense position. Um, I'm not talking about fighting and build up areas or all that. Um, so it's incredibly difficult to do what they're doing. Um, and it's, it's, warfare is, is fluid or it must be seen. You've got to react to what's opposing you. And you've got to be able to adjust and be flexible about that. And the Ukrainians have shown that they're willing to do that in incredibly well. Um, with pressure, political pressure, uh, uh, coming from behind as well. Um, you know, the West, oh, why aren't they doing better? Why haven't they, you know, managed to to overcome? They've, had, they've been at it for two months. Well, um, I think that what they've achieved hitherto has been incredible. Um, because they haven't got the, what I've suggested, the, 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 um, the amount of artillery, air supremacy, and a three-to-one advantage, none of those things. Yet they're still attriting Russians in greater numbers than they are being killed themselves. And, and remember, they are being killed. This is not easy. And, um, and it's incredibly difficult, trench warfare. Um, I've had little experience of that in the first Gulf War. Um, so I know what I'm talking about in that respect. It's not easy. It's hard and bloody and sweaty. Um, so I've just been hanging out with um, uh, some pals from the, the King's Royal Hussars who gave seven of their Challenger 2 tanks to the Ukrainians. And they said the Ukrainian colonel was delighted because theirs were nice and shiny. Uh, <laughs> and, and, they, um, and they were honoured, honoured to, um, to do that. And um, another bit of the British Army gave seven. So we've given the Ukrainians 14 Challenger 2 tanks. Do you think that's enough? No, in a word, no. I think that um, we should give them all we've got. It's not as though... I mean, I, I think that um, the Ukrainians are doing the fighting for us. The us, I mean, the West. They're fighting for, for their lives. They're fighting for themselves? They're fighting for themselves because... If, if if they didn't fight, they just wouldn't exist. But they're also more than that. They're fighting for freedom and liberty, and the, and 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 what the world order represents. I mean, you can't, you know, behave like a a thug and get away with it. Donald Trump seems to like Vladimir Putin. What are your views of Donald Trump? Well, I think that um, I, I think that uh, um, anyone who says you know they like or they can do business with Putin is kidding themselves. I think that I mean politely, he is perfidious. He's untrustworthy. I mean that's recognised on the world stage. This is Trump or Putin? Putin. I don't know enough about. Trump. I know more about Putin. I know he shouldn't be trusted. Prigozhin. When Putin made the deal with Prigozhin, were you surprised when Prigozhin was blown up in a fireball? No, I wasn't surprised. Um, it's what Putin does. It's what he does. He, 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 yes, he, he, his rules are taken from the, the gangster 
handbook, really. He's a bully and a gangster. Yeah, I wasn't surprised at all. So when a Ukrainian MP told me last year that she thought that there was an, at least a lot of people in Washington, D.C., in the West Wing, in the Biden administration, who want the Ukrainians to defeat the Russians on November the 5th next year, the day after the American presidential election, because they're afraid of Russian chaos. They're afraid, for example, of Chechen Islamists getting hold of a nuclear weapon and of having to fight Trump in an election campaign when there is so much chaos in Russia, it looks as though that those of us in the West who argue for helping the Ukrainians are responsible for this chaos. What's your answer to that? The argument being, don't overthrow Putin because what follows is worse. Well, I think that's just a um, uh, 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 childish thought. I think that it's 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 geopolitical politics um, gone mad in a way. Um, we should always fight for what is the right thing. We should be sure of what we want, which is free, democratic, basically liberal countries to be able to exist as they want to. Um, it would be simply, um, it, it would be appalling to have it any other way. Um, I think the Chinese are watching very closely to see if there's enough um, resilience. And I think the Americans are aware that they're watching too. I think that's what's probably pushing them a little more to, to do a little more. And um, because Taiwan would be the next target. If Putin wins Ukraine, the Chinese will take a Taiwan. Yes, I, I would, I would, I would <clears throat> find that difficult to argue against. Would you... Um... But I don't think that's the only reason. I think, I think there's a much more basic reason for, for, for fighting for what we believe in, for fighting for what's right. I mean, otherwise, what have we learned since 1940, 1945? What have we learned? Never um, again, they said. Well, they said that after the First World War. Um, and... Um, the academics understood Hitler's uh, reasons for going to war, and that was Versailles, which was an appalling excuse to give him. Um, it might have, it might have been a factor, but factors should be argued against and say, no, that is the wrong thing. It might be a factor that, you know, we didn't do more in in 2014 when they moved into Crimea illegally, annexing that. But that's not an excuse for him to go further. That's just an academic fact that academics like to use as an argument when writing an essay. This is beyond that. It's beyond essays. It's beyond writings. It's action that's required now. And you've been there. I've been there. The suffering that the Ukrainians are going through is... It's sort of immeasurable. Is there one moment that sums that up, something that you saw or heard about? Well, we've recently, you know, had one of our drives, Ukrainian drivers, drafted in to the army, and he's absolutely determined and willing to do what is required. Um, that, 
too brings it home. There are lots of things, but um, no, you've got to go there to see. If we don't help the Ukrainians enough in a timely fashion to defeat Putin, do you think he'll come for us? Not necessarily militarily. Well, I, I, yes, I've no doubt that he would. Um, if we don't defeat Putin, I think that he won't only come for us. I think it's he will encourage him to behave badly towards Latvia, Lithuania, Finland even. Um, those who are immediate neighbours um, should be more concerned and would be more concerned and the geopolitics of that would be unsettling to say the very least but he has come for us I mean look at the Salisbury situation look at the murders in London that he's committed I think we should have we should, if that happens again, take it far more seriously. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know enough of what goes on in, 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 in higher echelons of government and diplomacy. Um, but the perception is important too. We, we let Putin get away with murder, British yes. citizens, Litvinenko right. and George well, that, Sturgis, again and, and again and again. D disgusting um, um, d since then, you know, and to allow uh, the Russians to buy up so much of London. Well, that's what I hear anyway. You know, I think it's, I think it's pretty evident when if you go up there and see some of the places and people say well you know these people don't you shouldn't blame all russians but we can't exculpate the russians they must um bear responsibility too they Really, they have it. Only they have it in their power to get rid of him. I think defeat on the battlefield will hurry that along, but defeat on the battlefield, in a way, would would not automatically mean that. It's highly likely that, they, but he's so ensconced in the Kremlin that unless he's defeated on the battlefield, he will continue to will power there. Um, but one can't appeal to Putin. He's a psychopath. I mean, that's why. I what think, I, what I, I could okay, say yes, is you've lost. You've lost. The only thing that you can do sensibly is to is to leave. James Hewitt, thank you very much. Slava Ukraine. Haroam Slava. So this is interview has taken place as part of the Vladimir Putin Do Fuck Off Festival. <coughs> James is far too well bred to say this, but I'm gonna say it. I and we have a simple message of Vladimir Putin that goes like this, Vladimir Putin do fuck off. If you support our festival, the profits, all the profits go to Ukraine charities. Cheers and thank you for watching. Yeah, quite well. That's the best thing he's done. <laughs>